Line of Fire with your host, biblical scholar and cultural commentator, Dr. Michael Brown. Your voice for moral sanity and spiritual clarity. Call 866-34-TRUTH to get on the line of fire. And now, here's your host, Dr. Michael Brown. It is Thoroughly Jewish Thursday. Welcome to the broadcast. Michael Brown here. I'm not sure what happened to my voice today, but it is yours truly for those watching. Yes, it's me. For those listening, trust me, it's me. Welcome to the broadcast. We're going to have a fascinating conversation today, and we're going to take your Jewish-related call. So any Jewish-related question of any kind, 866-34-TRUTH, 866-348-7884 is the number to call. Another reminder, if you want to join us in Israel next year, God willing, May 2023, the trip of a lifetime. So many ways, an amazing, incredible experience we'll have together, enriching on every level. If you want to go, go to the website, askdrbrown.org, askdrbrown.org. Right on the homepage, you'll find info on the tour. If you want to go, the earlier you register, the better, because seating is limited. Okay, a few years ago, I saw some articles online and was hearing people talk about, oh, the, the Bible and the Torah, it prescribed the use of cannabis. It was part of the holy oil that was to be used in the sanctuary. So I looked up the claim. It was utterly bogus. It had zero academic support, was easily refuted. I wrote about it way back then. <laughs> well, a few weeks ago, I wrote an article about whether uh, marijuana should be legalized, gave him, gave him my own opinion on it. And it got a lot of attention on the Daily Wire where I posted the article. So I wrote a follow-up article, what the Bible really says about cannabis. And it was a, a complete fresh new article from the old one I'd written some years ago, uh, overlapping, but a fresh new article. And to my utter surprise, this article, which is just for subscribers to Daily Wire, so not even just the large general public reading, but their subscribers, which is, I don't know, almost a million people, there are right now almost a thousand comments to the article. Just posted a couple of days ago, almost a thousand comments to the article. So I decided to come on the broadcast today, as it is Thoroughly Jewish Thursday, and get into a little more depth. Those who are able later to go to our YouTube channel, Ask Dr. Brown, ASK Dear Brown on YouTube, or uh, on, our, on our homepage, AskDrBrown.org, You'll be able to watch where I put some slides up, but otherwise I'm going to explain everything for all those, because I know the vast majority of you are listening, for all those listening by radio or podcast. Again, <coughs> excuse me, if you want to interact with me on the subject or you have a Jewish-related question on any other subject, we'll get to the calls a little bit later in the show, 866-34-TRUTH. So some people raised in their comments, and I've only seen some of the comments, uh, Genesis 1 where God says to humanity, to Adam, see, I give you, Genesis 129, see, I give you every seed-bearing plant that is upon all the earth and every tree that has seed-bearing fruit, they shall be yours for food. So the argument is God gave us every plant to use, and marijuana is one of those plants, and it can be used for many good purposes, so we should use it. Well, whether it's good or not, whether it has value or not, is unrelated to this verse, which says it's for food. No one eats marijuana for nourishment. You can ingest it to get high. You can ingest it for medical purposes, but you don't eat it for, for sustenance, okay? So this is all the plants, seed-bearing plants, that were given for food, of course, before the, the fall, when presumably there are no poisonous plants. But even if you want to say it's all the plants, fine. It was for food, for eating. So this verse does not address the subject at all. Subsequent to the fall, when we have poisonous plants, are you saying that we should eat all plants because God gave us all plants? Or rather, see the use of the plant, whether it's helpful or not. But in any case, this is for food. Got it? All right, so completely unrelated. So the main verse that comes up is Exodus chapter 30. So for those watching, I'm going to put it on the screen for you in Hebrew, Hebrew on the left, and English on the right, okay? 
And here, um, God tells Moses, next take choice spices, 500 weight of solidified myrrh, half as much, 250 of fragrant cinnamon, 250 of aromatic, aromatic cane. The words aromatic cane, I have highlighted here, u kene bosem, all right? Aromatic cane. The word kene is cane, so kane, cane, and then bosem is aromatic, aromatic, sweet smelling, sweet spices, all right? I, I also highlighted in the same verse the word cinnamon, kinamon, or kinamon uh, besem. So this is related, so it is fragrant cinnamon. Again, you have besem, bosem for fragrant. But kinamon, if you look at it, you, you'll see that in the, the third letter, there's a dot in it. That's called the dagesh. That means it's a double N, all right? That's why cinnamon in English, which comes from the Hebrew kinamon, right? That's, that's why the English has a double N, cinnamon with two Ns. Contrast that with cannabis, which is spelled with two Ns, but the Hebrew from which this allegedly comes, from which this is allegedly derived, Kenebosum only has a single N. In other words, the phonetic correspondence from the Hebrew to the English, or from the Hebrew to the Greek to the English, is not there. It is plainly not there. And not only so, but the, the final M, the mem, is missing in cannabis. And you also have different vowels entirely, right? So instead of kane, you have kana. Instead of bo, you have be, and then you don't have the final M, and then you don't have a double N. So it completely breaks down. You say, well, where did anybody get this from? It was a Polish anthropologist, tragically lost her entire family to the Nazis in the Holocaust. As I read her brief biography, when she passed away, I believe at the age of 76, she was a professor at Hunter College in the States at that point. And she had a PhD in Poland, then earned a PhD in Columbia University. So she was a learned woman, but apparently lost her entire family so that she had no immediate surviving relatives, with some of the horror of the Holocaust in Poland. And she was an anthropologist. So she looked at folklore through the world and different customs through the world. And in 1936 said, looks like cannabis actually comes from these words in Hebrew. Now, there is, there is no linguistic phonetic correspondence. It simply doesn't work. Any, any more than the word mice is related to the name Moses. It, it doesn't work. It's completely unrelated. And in all my years of, of studying, getting my PhD in Semitic languages, her name never came up once. Never an article, never a book, never referenced because she was not a Semitic scholar. She was not a linguist. She was not an etymologist. She was an anthropologist, right? Studying human traditions and human development over the centuries. So it is a complete bogus, complete bogus uh, comparison or argument that God prescribed cannabis in the sanctuary. This has nothing to do with bias. This has nothing to do with the fact that I was a pot smoker before I got saved in 71, also a heroin shooter, so I did everything. But it has nothing to do with the, the fact, excuse me, that I haven't used drugs, illicit drugs in over 50 years. I'm just saying what the Hebrew says. You say, well, all right, I see the thing about the, the comparison and the letters don't work and it breaks down there. But how else do we know you're right, Brown? Because you're just making this claim. And we can't just accept it because you have these degrees. Fair enough. Fair enough. So here's the next question. When the ancient translators saw these words, the ancient Greek translators, the ancient Aramaic translators, the ancient Latin translators, the ancient... Syriac translators, how did they translate this? Because you would think that somebody in the ancient world knew that this referred to cannabis and not just general aromatic cane, okay? So let's take a look at what's called the Targum. This is Targum Unkelos. This is the Aramaic translation of the Torah, okay? When Unkelos saw this, so again, Exodus chapter 30, verse 23, he translated with u kene busma, u kene busma, which is basically the exact same thing in Hebrew, nar and Aramaic, all right? And aromatic canes, you could make it plural there, aromatic canes. But it's the exact same words. In other words, 
he didn't think, Uncle Os didn't think that this was the word for hemp or something like that. No, he just understood aromatic cane. Now, here's what's interesting. The Greek language already had the word cannabis. The Greek language had it. It existed already when the Greek translators in the, in the third century BC translated the Torah from Hebrew into Greek. These were Jewish Greek scholars. The word cannabis, <laughs> excuse me, existed already in Greek. We'll show you that in a moment, okay? They didn't translate with cannabis. How did they translate? They translated with kal uh, kalamu yodos. So it, this is, again, sweet-smelling fragrance. This is, uh, this is not hemp. This is not cannabis. They had the word for cannabis. They, they didn't use it. They didn't use it. The same with the Peshitta, the Syriac translators, a few hundred years after the time of Jesus. For those that, that know Syriac, I'll just put the slide up. It's highlighted for you. But they did the same thing. You, you even have that same bosem in Hebrew. You have it here in Syriac. All right? So, the, <coughs> excuse me, the same thing. They saw it. They did not translate with hemp or any form of that or cannabis. No. They simply translated the Hebrew correctly. Aramaic cane, sweet smelling cane. Uh, the same thing with the Vulgate. Jerome in Latin in, in the fourth century. All right? What does he have? Calamy, right? Which the King James wrongly then derived calamus from that. It was speaking of something else. But again, they didn't use a cannabis word. Didn't use it. And, and look, cannabis, I want to put up one more slide for you. The Liddell Scott Jones Greek English lexicon, the premier lexicon of classical Greek to this day, a massive work of scholarship. It, it knows the word cannabis, okay? Notice with, with two N's, the Hebrew kene only has one N, two N's, and it goes, you know, Herodotus uses, it goes all the way back in the ancient Greek world. And when it's, when it's derived, uh, where they're trying to get where the word comes from, there's a reference to Hebrew. Why? Because it has nothing to do with Hebrew kene bosom. And all the ancient translators fully understood that. They knew it. Every solid dictionary of the Hebrew language knows it. Why do people reject it? Because they want to have their Bible and pot too. That's the only reason. There's not a shred of scholarly evidence to support it. Not a shred. We'll be right back. So how did the fall affect humanity? Well, profoundly, deeply, in every way. We went from fellowship with God to separation from God. We went from spiritual life to spiritual death. We went from the potential of living forever to now having bodies that will decay and die. We went from trust to fear. It goes on and on. Everything negative that we see in the human race today murder and rape and war, everything that we see in terms of people butchering each other, in, in terms of hatred, in terms of bitterness, in terms of lust, in terms of greed, in terms of every wrong thing that's in the human race, all of that happened because of the fall. Look at what Paul wrote, Romans chapter 5. Romans 5, he says this, therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin. And so death spread to all men because all sin. So every human being is born with a death sentence hanging over them. Every human, is, human being is born fallen, meaning that it is our nature to sin. Every human being is born as an object of wrath. Uh, ultimately, this is what we grow up to and become because this is in our very nature. You don't have to teach a child to be selfish. You don't have to teach a child to lie, to disobey. This is part of our fallen human nature. So physical death is an outgrowth of it. Sickness, pain, disease, what we have in this world, all the sin of the world, and then spiritual separation from God, being in a spiritually dead state. That's what happened because of the fall. The good news is through the one man, Jesus, we can be forgiven, receive eternal life, and have more through Jesus on the other side of the cross than Adam and Eve had before the fall. 
Dr. Michael Brown. Get on the line of fire by calling 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Thanks, friends, for joining us on Thoroughly Jewish Thursday. I'm going to go to the phone shortly, 866-348-7884. Yeah, whatever's going on with my voice, feel good otherwise, and hopefully doesn't put you off too much. Um, but having said that, yeah, check out vitaminmission.com if you haven't. My friend, Dr. Mark Stengler, my personal physician, just great, great health supplements, and he's a sponsor of this broadcast, so you order there, go through the, the site, vitaminmission.com. You get a 10% discount when you order using the code that's listed there. And then Dr. Stengler turns around and makes a generous contribution to our ministry to help us talk to more people like you. All right. So just a little bit more on the cannabis question. There's an etymology online website that I checked today. And its entry for cannabis, as far as I can see, is, is reliable. So... The word cannabis, it lists as this, common hemp from cannabis, modern Latin plant genus named, 1728, from Greek cannabis, hemp, a Scythian or Thracian word. And then it gives us as a source of Armenian kanaf and these other languages as well. So etymologists have traced this back to a, uh, a Scythian or Thracian word. So the argument is, oh, no, no, but it goes back to, it doesn't go back to Hebrew. It, the argument breaks down on every single point. Well, I saw a comment that was posted, and it said, well, what, what about on Sfaria? This is a great website, sfaria.org, great compendium of traditional Jewish sources. There's an article, Kosher Cannabis, Judaism and Marijuana, by Rabbi Aaron Filmus. And uh, it goes down, quotes Genesis 129 about what can Jews inhale, and then quotes what we've just been reading in, in uh, Exodus, the 30th chapter, and tries to, and, and then quotes the Polish anthropologist we've mentioned, Sula Bennett, and he calls her a Semitic etymologist, which she wasn't. At least she was not known for that. She did not specialize in that, so as to be known in the larger uh, academic world as a Semitic etymologist. She was known as an anthropologist, as a learned anthropologist. Two different fields, all right? And she claims there's an astonishing resemblance between the Semitic can bos and the Scythian cannabis. It was not Semitic can bos, okay? It was not Semitic can bos. There is Semitic cane bosem, all right? With a single N, not a double N, and on and on. So it, it completely breaks down. So he quotes her. And then he, he quotes uh, an article, uh, another Jewish man, did Aaron the high priest smoke? This is published in Haaretz a few years back. Uh, did Aaron the high priest smoke? And said, hey, play on words, high priest, get it? There's nothing, uh, excuse me, of academic substance in either of these articles to back the idea that cannabis was prescribed for use in the Bible or recommended for use. The Bible basically doesn't comment on it, just does, it doesn't comment on other plants or plants from which we get opium and things like that. It does comment a lot on drinking, right? It does comment about getting drunk, the proper use of alcohol or the abusive use of alcohol, it comments on those things, but it doesn't comment on that. So look, I don't know what I could do other than one, show you that the phonetic correspondence does not work. That's one. Two, show you that all the ancient versions, which were the best scholars of their day or people fluent in biblical Hebrew, translating into Greek or Aramaic or Syriac or Latin, that every one of them translated differently than cannabis, basically rightly translated into Hebrew, and that every major dictionary you're gonna find of Greek where it's gonna go through etymology or of Hebrew, biblical Hebrew, will say, no, they're not going to even address the cannabis issue because it's unrelated. It's unrelated. Just going to say the Hebrew means this, Greek means this, etc. So you, you can make the Bible mean what you want. You could say, well, according to the Bible, there is no God. According to the Bible, 
There is no heaven. According to the Bible, there is no Jesus. You could fantasize as much as you want. It doesn't change the truth. It does not change the truth. So the whole question of should cannabis be legal or not, should a Christian get high or not, those are separate questions. This question is easily dismissed, and there's no argument about it from a linguistic, lexical, etymological viewpoint. Zero. Zero. Prove me wrong. Go ahead. Prove me wrong academically on this. All right? Go ahead. Phone lines are open. 866 Three, four, truth. With that, we go to the phones. Uh, Ruben in Brownsville, Texas. Welcome to the line of fire. Hello, shalom, Dr. Brown. This is Ruben Varela from Brazil. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, Dr. Brown, so I have a question. Uh, well, I'm a Gentile believer. I currently go to a Christian church. I practice Messianic Judaism as a Gentile. But um, what is the Nazarene Jewish movement? I see the difference between that movement and... Uh, Hebrew roots, Hebrew roots and Messianic Judaism, but I can't find any reliable source online as to how this uh, Nasser, modern Nasser and Jewish movement was uh, created. It's, it's just what names people put on things, Ruben. In, in other words, the closest equivalent to the Nazarenes of the early centuries of this era would be Messianic Jews. Those are Jewish mm -hmm. believers in Jesus who maintain their Jewish identity, but are Orthodox believers. You had other early groups. Uh, you had the Ebionites that were Jewish believers who maintained their identity, but they were heretical in some of their beliefs. Or the Corinthians, not the Corinthians, but the Corinthians, also Jewish believers with some heretical beliefs. So the ones that rejected the authority of rabbinic Judaism, the ones who accepted the Orthodox gospel and views of Jesus and Paul and things like that, but continued to live as Jews and were often misunderstood by the church, those were the Nazarenes. So the modern equivalent of that would be Messianic Jews who hold to the fundamentals of the faith, but continue to identify as Jews. Uh, now, others may use the term for themselves today, and everybody uses it differently. In other words, you've, you've got heretical groups in Hebrew roots and some that are not as bad. You, you've got Messianic Jews who have gone heretical, and so people use the term in different ways. And I, I don't know myself. I've never looked at it to see if you could trace back to who starts saying we are the modern Nazarenes. But it's basically a term that people are putting on themselves, maybe accurately, maybe inaccurately. So I would, I would completely look past the term, right? I would not even focus on that. I'd just say, okay, what do you actually believe and how do you live? And that would be the only thing. They could put a good term on it or a bad term on it. The question is, how are they living? What do they believe? Those would be the issues to me. And again, it's going to be different from one group to another. But we know the danger signs. We know the denial of the deity of Yeshua, great danger sign. We know the danger sign of the you know, rejecting of the writings of, of Paul or Hebrews or things like that. We know the great danger sign of saying everyone is obligated to observe the Sinai Covenant, Jew and Gentile, or you're not right with God. So you can look for those danger signs in these groups, but beyond that, it's it's all a matter of how they use the term. So that's best I can answer it. Okay, thank you, Doc. Can, can I ask you a, a quick question? Regarding sure, Matthew sure. 20, 19? Yeah. Since I was going into it, is, is the Trinitarian uh, baptismal uh, formula of um, Ma Matthew twenty eight nineteen uh, authentic or was it added added uh, later on? Because I see some sources that say that it wasn't in the original Greek text. No, it's it's authentic. Um, there and it's reflected in early literature like the Didache, which is maybe early second century, so within a hundred years of the time of Jesus, and they reflect that the, the writing there, so called teaching of the twelve apostles. That reflects it as well. So if, if I was looking that up, right, so what I would do, I, I'd, uh, I'd go to my software, right, uh, and I'd, I'd pull up Bruce Metzger's textual commentary on the New Testament. So it's just take a second to do that, but we'll do this together here. And, and what Metzger does is, is he has uh, a textual commentary on the Greek New Testament. So 
for every single variant, he's going to have a detailed note. And then he's going to rate them. Okay, this is how certain the reading is and things like that. So when you go to Matthew 28, 19, all right, uh, when you go there, uh, you see, actually, there's not a note on it. <laughs> in other words, this is not something that's in dispute. So you may hear, oh, it's in dispute and things like that. But as far as textual scholarship, this is not something that's in dispute that textual critics wrestle with, is it there or not? You know, contrary to say John 8, 1 through 11, the adulterous woman, or Mark 16, 9 through 20, you know, there's great discussion among textual scholars there. But as far as Matthew 28, 19, nope, uh, not at all. Hey, Ruben, thank you for the calls. Much appreciated. All right, we've got some phone lines open. So if you would like to call in, 866-348. 7884. Any Jewish related question could be related to the Hebrew Bible, Messianic prophecy, Jewish background to the New Testament, questions about Israel today. Uh, glad to answer any Jewish related question. And Angelo, you'll be first up on the other side of the break when we come back. So stay right here, folks, on the line of fire. And hey, I guess you got used to my voice, a little bit different today, but the same thoroughly Jewish host. On Thoroughly Jewish Thursday, we'll be right back. What are your... Christians say that Jesus is God. They don't mean that God ceased to be God in heaven and came down on the earth and was no longer God in heaven like some character from Greek mythology. They believe and understand that the Father through whom all things were created, the source of all things, remains enthroned in heaven, filling the universe with his presence, and that the Holy Spirit works invisibly among us. But yes, as followers of Jesus and believers in the scriptures, we believe that Jesus himself is eternal deity. Now, it's interesting in John, the 20th chapter, that Thomas who had been a skeptic. He was one of the disciples, but he, he couldn't believe Jesus really rose from the dead unless he saw him with his own eyes and, and saw the nail prints. And he had to see it for himself in order to believe. But once he saw Jesus risen from the dead in John chapter 20, what does it say? John 20, 28, Thomas says to him, my Lord and my God. Wow. So, so here you have Thomas confessing him as God. And people say, yeah, but when did Jesus ever say that he himself was God? Well, of course, he tells us in John 10 that he and the Father are one. You say, yeah, but John 17, he prays that we would be one with him the way he's one with the Father. Does that mean we all become God? Okay, that's a fair question. Well, what he tells us in John 14, that if we've seen him, we've seen the Father. So he and the Father are one in a unique sense. But it, it goes beyond that. When he calls himself the Son of God in unique relationship with his Father, the Jewish opponents in John 5 recognize that he's making himself equal with God. You say, but doesn't he say anything even more clear than that? Well, the clearest proclamation is in John chapter 8, verse 58. And there are many other ways that Jesus speaks of himself of being divine and being from above and being sent here into this world on a, a mission. But in John 8, 58, he says these words, Before Abraham was, I am. So Abraham lived 2,000 years before Jesus. Jesus doesn't even say, Before Abraham was, I was. That would be enough to speak of him as being preexistent. But no, he says, Before Abraham was, I am. And that I am proclamation is uniquely God's proclamation. I am he. I am the one. I am. I am the eternal one. I am the I am. 
Jesus strikingly is identifying himself with Yahweh, the Creator, in John 8:58, the clearest passage where Jesus identifies himself as being God. It's Dr. Michael Brown. Thanks for joining us, friends, on Thoroughly Jewish Thursday. Michael Brown, delighted to be with you. 866-348-7884. Going to the phones momentarily. So I've got a headline that I'm looking at on my screen. Jews, non-Christians, not part of conservative movement, GOP candidate consultant. Let me read that again. Jews non-Christians, not part of conservative movement, GOP candidate consultant, both Republicans and Democrats have called on Mastriano to withdraw his ad campaign from the Gab social media platform. All right, so this is in, in uh, Pennsylvania Republican gubernatorial candidate Doug Mastriano, who is an outspoken, unashamed Christian. He has advertised on Gab, social media alternative to Twitter and the like. But unfortunately, while Gab is not censoring people on the right as Twitter is, the leader of Gab, the uh, CEO, Andrew Torba, has made numerous statements that many consider blatant, <laughs> excuse me, blatantly anti-Semitic. And many would say a spouse is a form of Christian nationalism that is terribly dangerous. Well, I, I just looked at my Twitter feed right before coming back on the air during the break, and I saw a post from about 30 minutes ago from Dr. D. Jackson. Dr. Brown, I would love to hear your take on Christian nationalism as espoused by Andrew Torba, CEO of Gab, or any thoughts. Thank you. So I wrote back, said, I'm about to address this on the air, so we will reach out to Mr. Torba privately and invite him to come on the air with me and present his views making clear that I differ strongly with his perspective. If he declines the invitation or simply doesn't get back to us, then, God willing, I will address the quotes, his stance. I'll address it fairly in writing and on the air. But as always, if we can reach out to someone first and get them to interact with us and present their side, we will absolutely do that. As for the quotes in the article, as for the form of Christian nationalism that are espoused by Mr. Torba, as I understand his views, I categorically reject them. My next book coming out in September, The Political Seduction of the Church, I believe will be a tremendously important volume, one of the most controversial that I've written, but tremendously important. In fact, beginning next week, we'll tell you how you can pre-order, get a signed copy of the book and uh, a numbered copy from the first printing. So we are, we are eager to get this in your hands. And of course, I address those questions in the book. Broader question, do I expect extreme forms of Christian nationalism, namely that Christians are called to take over America and quote, disciple the whole nation by getting everyone under Christianity and under Christian law of some kind, do I expect that to be anti-Semitic? Absolutely. No question about it. All right, let's go to the phones. In Richmond, Virginia, Angelo, thanks for holding. Welcome to the line of fire. Hey, God bless you, Dr. Brown. I appreciate your ministry. Thank you. Uh, I had a question that I wanted to address. Uh, as, a, as a Christian and, and an IMG, a Gentile, as you would call us, uh, I wanted to know the impact or, or the significance of the synagogue in the days of Jesus. And, Kind of how that concept, as far as you know, as Jesus warned his disciples, you know, kicked out of the synagogue. Just the impact of the synagogue during that time period, and how significant the removal of the people from the synagogue was to the people of Jesus' time, or the disciples and the converts during that during that time. Yes, sir. Uh, absolutely happy to answer. And let me first say, uh, as you mentioned, a Gentile believer, as I as I would refer to it, the word Gentile in in the Bible can have two different meanings, uh, a neutral meaning and a negative meaning. The negative meaning is like pagans, you know, just worldly people, ungodly, the people that don't know the one true God, the people of the nations who worship their other gods. And that's why 
in Ephesians 4, Paul says, hey, don't live like the Gentiles, meaning the other Gentiles. Don't, don't live the way they live. The other meaning of the word is simply the people of the nations uh, or the word nation. God told Abram, you will be a great goy, and the word goy is the word for Gentile. So in other words, you'll be a great nation. So the goyim, those are the nations and the people of the nations. So Paul uses it in that sense in Romans 11 when he says, hey, I'm writing to you Gentiles. As the apostle to the Gentiles, I want, to provoke, uh, I, I, want to, I want you to provoke my people Israel to envy. So when I use it, obviously, it's in a positive sense of people from the nations. And uh, just want to, I, I know you understand that. I just want to say that for everybody, okay. everybody else. Okay, so um, the synagogues were an innovation of the Pharisees because there was just one place of worship in ancient Israel, and that was the temple. There was one place where uh, uh, three times a year all the males of Israel were to make pilgrimage to the temple and to celebrate uh, the feasts and things like that. And if there were special sacrifices you had to offer, you weren't allowed to offer them just in your own city or things like that. You were to bring them to the temple. You would bring your tithe periodically to the temple and things like that. So what happened was in between the time of the Old Testament and the New Testament, the Pharisees developed this idea of having meeting houses, not many temples. They weren't a substitute for the temple. You couldn't offer sacrifices there. You didn't have an, you know, the, the full Ark of the Covenant there, things like that. But you would have these places in each community where Jews could come together, uh, be taught the scriptures together, say their prayers together, and have a, a basic place for communal life. So very much similar to a local church or synagogue today, that these were the communal meeting places where you would come with people of like faith, where you would hear the scriptures read, where you would hear teaching uh, from the scriptures, where you would offer your prayers together, and the prayers developed over, over a period of centuries. And it would also be a place where uh, community could, could have a basis. So let's say there were issues that you had to work through or figure out, or, or there needed to be some type of judgment carried out against someone, that the synagogue would be a convenient meeting place. And basically, the basic word means a, a, a meeting place or an assembly, a gathering. So by the time of Jesus, these were very common. And even though they were a Pharisaic innovation, it was something that he participated in because it was, it was part of Jewish life that, in, in his view, was, was positive and good. So to be put out of the synagogue, uh, as it mentions in, in John 16 that you quoted, or in the case of, of the man who was blind and was healed, uh, people were afraid to be put out of the synagogue in John 9. So that was, that was very much cutting you off from communal Jewish life. It would, it would be like today. Let's just say you were a Jehovah's Witness, right? And in your city, there were four different Jehovah's Witness congregations. And you were excommunicated for being a heretic. So you're put out of those communities. You're, you're not welcome in any of them. So you are now looked at as an outsider. Right, same thing with with Mormons, right? So in in the, in the in the early church, it was the same thing. You had kind of, you just had the church in a city, and you met in different places. And if you were put out, you were put out. That's what it was in the synagogue. It's not like you have. Well, I'll, I'll go instead to the from the conservative synagogue to the reform synagogue, or no, I'll go from the reform synagogue to the orthodox synagogue. Yeah. There were just the synagogues. Yeah. That was it. And you were put out there. That was a problem. Now. The Sadducees didn't participate in that. The Sadducees were all temple-based, so that did not exclude you from the temple. But in terms of practical life, especially after the destruction of the temple, that was bad news to be put out of the synagogues. Okay. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I, the concept of it, I thought, I mean, I think you broke, you broke it down perfectly. I understand exactly what you're saying. Um, I'm not going to ask you any additional questions for it because I need all that information to soak in into my head here, but that was a, a great explanation of what was going what was going on in that time period. Thank you very much. You you are very welcome, sir. I, I appreciate it. Eight six six three four truth. The other thing I appreciate as Angela's methodology to let things sink in, digest them, and then okay, maybe that triggers another question. That's that's a good way to learn. Get it? Let it sink in, digest it. And then from there, okay, maybe that triggers another question. Maybe that answers the questions. Uh, let me mention a, a couple things of interest as we talk about synagogues. <clears throat> in 
if we go to James, Jacob, the second chapter, uh, it, it's very interesting. Now, when I was putting up slides earlier in the broadcast, those were all from Accordance Bible software. Check it out at accordancebible.com. Just, just great software to dig into the scriptures and go as deep as you want to go into the original languages. But um, so I, I'm, I'm going to grab James Jacob, the second chapter, and pull that up on my screen here. All right. And I'll, I'll do it with the English on the left and the Hebrew on the right. And here's, here's what it says, beginning verse 1. I'm going to read from the ESV. My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing, and say, you sit here in a good place, or you sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, you stand over there, or sit down at my feet. Have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? All right? I want to focus on verse 2. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and when you look at the Greek word for assembly, it is synagogue. All right? Synagogue in Greek. So <clears throat> that's the word for synagogue. Now, elsewhere in the New Testament, where it occurs over 50 times, it's translated synagogue, 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 synagogue. One verse in the book of Acts where it's talking about a crowd that gathered in an assembly, that would be the one exception. Otherwise, when it's talking about a meeting place, it is always, in the New Testament, translated synagogue. How about the negative verses in Revelation 2.9 and Revelation 3.9, where Jesus refers to claim to be Jews and not, but are a synagogue of Satan? All our English translations translate with synagogue. Why don't they translate James, Jacob, 2 2 with synagogue? Well, because it's a Christian meeting place, it's not going to be a synagogue. Uh -uh. Jacob, James, is written to Jewish believers in Yeshua. And the place where they gathered together was called a synagogue, a meeting place. What do you know? They didn't use a different and new word. They used the word that was used in their Jewish community because that's what this was, a religious meeting place, a synagogue. What do you know? So what about the black Hebrew Israelites, or as they sometimes call themselves, the Hebrew Israelites? Are they a dangerous cult? Oh, yes, absolutely. You might have some who are very mild in their views, who simply believe that as blacks, that they are the original descendants of Israel, and they preach salvation through Jesus like anyone else. Okay, that's fine. But the ones that you find on the street corners, the ones that you find aggressively putting forth their message, they are full of hostility. They are full of hatred. They are bigoted. They are Jew haters. In other words, someone like me, they claim that we are the manifestation of Satan, that the white man is the manifestation of Satan. Many of them do not preach the Jesus of the scripture in any real respect. They preach a cult figure, Yeshua, or whatever name they give to him. And they would say that basically all blacks are the original descendants of Israel. So are there black Jews? Yes, absolutely. Like there are white Jews. Are there black Israelites? Yes, just like there are white Israelites. But are all blacks the descendants of the people of Israel? No, of course not. Categorically not. That is not so. That's part of their false teaching. Many of them are thoroughly legalistic in their teaching and then add in other customs. They are a cult. They are dangerous. They're spreading. Here's what Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians, the 11th chapter. He had this concern. He said this, if someone comes and proclaims another Jesus than the one we proclaimed, or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, or if you accept a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it readily enough. 
there is something happening now with the Hebrew Israelites, with the black Hebrew Israelites, especially in inner cities, especially in different uh, African-American communities in America, where they are gaining more and more following. But because they bring people into bondage, not freedom, because they practice hate and promote hate rather than love, because they preach another Jesus, when we bring the real message of truth and liberty and salvation through the Messiah, not through a white Jesus, but through the biblical Messiah, they'll find liberty. Dr. Michael Brown, get on the line of fire by calling 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Thanks for joining us, friends, on Thoroughly Jewish Thursday. Yours truly with this hoarse voice. I, You know, I, I don't know where it came from. I, I've been doing a ton of writing, as I always do, but amped up in certain ways, doing a ton of writing, but I haven't been doing a lot of, of interviews and video recording and teaching. Oh, all right, okay, this past weekend in Vegas, I, I produced this a couple times, Saturday night, Sunday morning, um, talking to people, like always, but so I'm not sure why the horses hopefully be utterly gone tomorrow but it is the same person speaking to you. When I got up this morning, I didn't sleep well. I didn't know why. And uh, I, I hadn't talked for a while. I was talking to the Lord just quietly. I hadn't talked to Nancy. She was, she was out in the yard already doing some work. And, and when I went to talk to her, my voice sounded about uh, five times worse than, than this. I thought, what in the world is going on? But anyway, glad to be hey uh, still the same voice for moral sanity and spiritual clarity the, the tone doesn't change that at all does it all right i i, I want to address one other issue you know my views as a jewish follower of jesus yeshua i believe that salvation forgiveness of sins is found in him and if we reject him we reject god's mercy if we reject what God did through him on the cross, we reject God's mercy. I do not believe there is another means of salvation for Jews as opposed to Gentiles. I, I do not believe that if a Jewish person observed the Torah faithfully, followed the traditions as best as they could, sought to honor God, that they can bypass the cross, that they have another way of redemption or another way of salvation. If Jesus had come into the world as a prophet to the nations and to die for the sins of the nations because they did not have the Torah and they did not have the traditions and they did not have a means of atonement, then that would be a separate ballgame. That would be completely different. So we would spend all of our time just going to the rest of the world, the Gentile world, because the Jews already had their own covenant. But the New Testament tells us the exact opposite message that Yeshua came first and foremost for his own people, the Jews. That it says in, in Matthew uh, chapter 1, verse 21, you'll call his name Yeshua, for he will save his people from their sins. His people. When you read Luke 1, the, the whole story is redemption coming to Israel and therefore then to the rest of the world. Salvation for Israel means salvation for the rest of the world. His whole self-identity through the Gospels, is that he's the Messiah of Israel. He dies as king of the Jews, just as he was born as king of the Jews. And when he rises from the dead, he then meets with his disciples and says, why were you so slow to believe what was written in the Scriptures, meaning the Hebrew Bible? And then he opens their minds so they could understand it, so they could see from Moses on through the Hebrew Scriptures. The prophecies were about his suffering and the glory that would follow. And then in the book of Acts, as Peter and the others begin to preach, remember all Jews preaching to Jews, <clears throat> what's Peter's message? Message It's to the house of Israel. Let all the house of Israel know that this same Yeshua, this Jesus whom you crucified, God has made both Lord and Messiah. So repent and turn to him. And that's the theme over and over in Acts 2 and Acts 3 and Acts 4 and Acts 5. Same thing over and over. In, in, in Acts 7, same thing. There's no reference to Gentiles. There's no reference even to Samaritans, which we consider like half-breed Jews, until the eighth chapter. There's Jews, 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 Jews from around the world 
hearing this message about the Jewish Messiah. And then with the destruction of the temple, God was shouting to the nation, the old system is done. I've instituted a new and better system. Atonement now comes through the Messiah. You no longer have your atonement system. You no longer have a functioning temple. You no longer have a functioning priesthood in the land with a functioning temple. That's gone because God has replaced it with something better. Now, there is a fascinating Jewish tradition in the Babylonian Talmud, Tractate Yoma, and it is page 39A and B, traditional printing of the Talmud. Every page is printed the same. It's not like a Bible if I tell you page 311. That doesn't mean anything. It depends on which Bible, how it's printed, so on. That's why we say chapter and verse. But in Talmud, as traditionally printed, the standard edition for centuries, you've got the, the front page is the A page, and you flip it, that's the B side. So the A side and the B side. So 39A and B. There's a fascinating tradition there in the tractate Yoma, Yoma meaning in Aramaic, the day, namely the Day of Atonement. And it talks about the, the high priest and everything that has to be done to separate him so he doesn't get ritually unclean before the Day of Atonement and, uh, and, and the rites that he goes through. And then these different signs that God gave to Israel as to whether their sins would be forgiven or not on the Day of Atonement. And there were three different primary signs. The priest would reach into an urn and, and, and pull out with his right hand and his left hand two lots. One was the goat that would be sacrificed to the Lord. That should come up in the right hand. That was a good sign. Left hand, bad sign. The other goat was the one called the scapegoat later that would carry the sins of Israel into the wilderness. It was ultimately killed, pushed off a cliff by the time of Jesus. So that one you wanted the priest to get in his left hand. If he pulled them out and it was reversed, the goat to be sacrificed to the Lord was in the left hand, bad sign, bad sign. The goat that would be sent out into the wilderness, the goat for Azazel, all right? Right hand, bad sign. Next would be that there was a scarlet thread that was tied to the gates of the temple doors, excuse me, to the front of the temple doors. And if the sins were forgiven in accordance with Isaiah 118, the scarlet thread would turn white. Also, some of the traditions said there was a scarlet thread put on, the, on, on one of the horns of the goat. And if that turned white, that was a good sign. If it didn't turn white, bad sign. Bad sign. Then last is the uh, the candlestick in the uh, in in the temple, the the menorah. So the the way it would be lit would be from east to west. All right. So the westernmost, excuse me, from west to east. So the westernmost candle was lit first, and if God was with Israel and forgave sins that year. That would be the last one to go out. First one lit, but the last one to go out. So the tradition records there in the Talmud that in the days of Shimon HaTzadik, so a righteous high priest that lived different dates given a few hundred years before Jesus, uh, that all the 40 years he was the high priest, every year God accepted the sacrifices on the Day of Atonement. Every year, all three signs came up positive obviously because of his righteousness and intercession. That would be the, the understanding. After that, some years good, some years bad. And when it was bad, the bad signs, well, the nation's discouraged. God did not receive our sacrifices and our fasting and our prayer. Then it says this, the last 40 years before the temple was destroyed, all three signs came up negative each of the 40 years. Now, there are rabbis very upset with me for using this. These are traditions. You're misusing them. I'm simply looking at what's given. Tanya Rabbanon, the, the rabbis taught, given as a historical account. Now, I understand there are many accounts in the Talmud, and they have to be historically analyzed. Did they happen as written? Were they revised over a period of time? I understand all that. But this is considered to be a widely reliable source and one of those negative things that you wouldn't document unless it really happen. You wouldn't create this normally, all right? So the last 40 years before the temple was destroyed, none of the signs came up positive. 
This is either from the beginning of Jesus' ministry until the destruction of the temple, or depending on dating, the time of his crucifixion to the destruction of the temple. So Jesus comes on the scene and ministers, more specifically dies for our sins, and God is shouting to the nation, the old system is over. The old system is over. I've given you a new and better way. And when you rejected the new and better way, then judgment came, temple was destroyed. That's the bad news. The good news is the new and better way is still here. To this day, traditional Jews who are some of the, the most sincere people that I know, the traditional Jews that I've gotten to know over the years, here yeah, you have flakes just like I have flakes in the church and flakes everywhere. But I've gotten to know so many deeply sincere men and women and, and people who really desire to honor God and do what is right and live for him and believe that they're doing the right thing by adhering to the traditions. In fact, they believe to deviate from that would be grave sin against God. I just want to say to every traditional Jew listening to me, you still don't have atonement outside of Yeshua. You still don't have atonement outside of the Messiah being the righteous sacrifice for our sins. Not human sacrifice, but rather the atoning power of the death of the righteous. Mitatan shal tzadikim techaper, as is stated often in rabbinic literature. So I want to appeal to everyone listening. Do you have forgiveness? Do you know that you know that your sins have been blotted out? Are you in right relationship with God? All of us have sinned. All of us have gone our own way. The Lord has laid on him, Yeshua, the Messiah, the iniquity of all of us. All right, friends, back with you tomorrow. You've got questions. We've got answers.